Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today uh, for the third part of our entrepreneurship series hosted by Flow's Global Employment Initiative. Um, today we're going to be talking to EF, successful EFMs in the sales and retail sectors uh, in our series called Learn From Those Who Have Gone Before. Um, this is the third. The first two have been very successful. We've talked to people in uh, professional services and in uh, health and wellness. Um, so this, like the previous two, will be uh, recorded and will be available on the on Flow's global webinar um, webpage as well as GEI's Outside the Mission sites, which are being revamped right now. So I want to thank everyone for coming today. I would like to give a special thank you to the three GAs who have been putting in all the work to make this webinar series possible. Uh, Anna Kolodzinski, uh, who along with Kim Raimundi uh, are, are two GEAs representing South America and the Caribbean, uh, and Fred Wilson, who takes care of uh, Eastern Europe for us. So I'd like to thank all of them. I would really like to thank our four presenters, the EFMs who have joined us today to share their stories with other EFMs who are considering entrepreneurship as a portable career and have come to get more information from them. So thank you for coming and sharing, and I'm going to turn it over to our hosts. All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good day to everyone. My name is Anna Kolodzinski. As Jeremy stated, I am one of the GEAs in South America. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking to four panelists, which is a little bit different than in the past. We've only had three. So for those of us who, for those of you who have joined for the previous sessions, um, we will have an opportunity to speak to a little bit more panelists. However, that means we'll have a little bit shorter time for some of the Q&As. Just for a little update on the structure, um, I will go ahead after my introduction and read the bios for each of the panelists. And then we're going to do a short poll. Once I've read the bios, the first panelist, Raul, will be, taking, will be taking the stage and doing his presentation. And then he'll have time for about one or two questions. After Raul finishes, um, we'll move on to each of the panelists. One thing to note, Raul will only be able to be on for the beginning portion of the webinar. So if you have any urgent questions, please ask, ask them at the beginning. My colleague Fred and Istanbul will be the one who's moderating the Q&A. And there will be time at the end of the presentations for any additional Q&A as well. I would like to thank all the panelists for all the work that they've put into this, and to my colleagues Fred and Kim for their work as well. All right, well, let's get started by just reading off who these wonderful people are. I'm going to turn off my video to make sure that we can maintain bandwidth um, during this part of the presentation. Wonderful. So Raul is the co-founder of four companies, an experienced senior consultant with a demonstrated history of working in the public policy industry. He is a skilled in data science, political analysis, and entrepreneurship. He's a strong entrepreneur professional with a master's degree that focused in development economics and international development from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. He's the founder and CEO of Vartis, Riga's first independent online home appraiser. Our second panelist is Indira. She's originally from the former Yugoslavia and immigrated to the United States in 1996. Since becoming a US citizen, she worked as an assistant vice president of Bank of America's small business banking and assistance coordinator, and in the roles at the US Department of State in the Balkans, in addition to her year as an adjunct lecturer in accounting at the University, the American University in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In January 2015, during her time as an EFM in Austria, Dira founded Wines of Ilya, a wine import company dedicated to bringing wines from the former Yugoslavia to European Union consumers. And in March of 2016, she expanded her business to the United States. As the brand ambassador, Indira participates in wine shows in all the states where her wines are present and organizes wine tastings to educate sales staff and consumers on over 2,000 year long tradition of winemaking in the land once known as ancient Illyria. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, you'll definitely have a chance to correct me later. Our third panelist is Jack. Jack is the founder of Ugly Bags. Fell in love with the idea of running his own business at a very young age. 
He started off selling toys from Cracker Jack boxes for 10 cents each. And in the second grade, that was in the second grade, sorry. In the sixth grade, he rented his best friend's bike to his neighborhood kids for about 50 seconds for a 10-minute joyride. They would then split the profit and buy candies from the local gas station. As an adult, Jack went on to help start nine different companies. His current company, Ugly Bags, specializes in customized luggage. Our final panelist, Natalia, graduated from Boston College with a BA in International Studies in 2004 and worked for a DC global corporate consulting firm before graduating from Georgetown's Master's in Communication, Culture, and Technology program. After graduating, she worked for three years at the University of Oklahoma's military programs at their Pacific office in Okinawa, Japan, before returning to the United States and managing public relations for the Wounded Warrior Project New York office. In 2011, she founded Culture Baby, a mission-driven e-commerce business which she ran first from New York and then from Rabat, Morocco, before she returned to DC to pursue her passion of social enterprise and conscious cons commerce at Georgetown University Global Social Enterprise Initiative, which is part of the McDougall School of Business. She lives in Alexandria with her husband, a major in the US Marine Corps and her two sons. And she recently completed an international business and policy program. Thank you again for each of the panelists to participate. Before we launch into Raul's presentation, I would like to take a short poll for the panelists. Please go ahead and start voting to make sure that you are able to vote. Please let me know. There we go. I just wanted to make sure. The idea is for the participants to be able to express kind of where they are in the process of self-employment. So it looks like the vast majority of the people participating in the poll are people who are still kind of exploring ideas in self-employment, which is great because each of the panelists have some very different types of businesses and can provide a lot of different types of experiences on how they came to start these businesses. Wonderful. Thank you guys for participating in the poll. I'm now going to go back into the presentation. And Raul, as we transition back into the presentation, I will hand everything over to you. So Raul, if you are ready, please ready. let me know and you'll have control of, there we go, wonderful. If you're able to join us via video, wonderful. If not, I understand. And the stage is now yours, so go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh Hello to everyone from Brussels. Uh, I am uh, happy to join everybody in this wonderful panel and uh, share with you uh, some of the things I've learned um, uh, in my experience. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, not just from the current project, uh, but uh, I've been, um, I've started other companies and uh, the current company I'm uh, I'm working on it's uh, it's called Bartus.eu. It's like at Zillow.com for those of you interested in real estate uh, for Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so I'm trying to to bring data science and data analysis to the real estate market in real in, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So my biggest fear. Uh, or my biggest hesitation of beginning the project, and I would bring it and narrow it down to two. Uh, first is fear of failure. Um, after a career as a consultant, over 10 years as a consultant, um, one uh, wants, wants to keep his reputation. His reputation. I was um, worried about um, failing. Uh, a startup is a very risky endeavor. So there's no way around this. It's risky. It can fail. It still can fail. I'm not uh, out of the woods yet, but failing is something that um, should, shouldn't scare everybody. Everybody fails. Failing is learning, and it's a badge of honor if a startup fails. So um, 
one has to be ready to fail, one has to know when to fail, eh, but also has to be ready to succeed. The first, the first uh, test I had is if I was going to find enough data in Latvia to start my business. And I was, I was afraid that it's going to be a project so visible that even the data was not going to be there. So I, I fought this fear by grabbing my bike, going to the public cadasters, talking to everyone who could dare to speak with me in a foreign language, and, uh, and I found the data. So fear of failure, there's no way around it. Uh, I, I had to deal with it. And the other one is losing income. I, again, uh, a startup is failing, and um, one has to be able to um, uh, prepare financially for a time with lost income and uh, start with uh, from from a from a healthy financial position uh, without credit card debt or so uh, hesitation was no income income uh, losing income and one has to prepare for for a couple of um, at least for the very initial part and know uh, how to deal with this uh, loss of income um, Am I supposed to uh, change the slide myself? I'm gonna do it. So the biggest challenges I have faced in this particular project, I, there were some skills that I needed with me and I did not possess. So finding the right person to do it with me, a co-founder was the biggest challenge. Um, this is in two levels. On the one hand, you want technical skills, the best you can find, but um, also, you want honesty. You want someone uh, to share um, a lot of information, um, your professional career. Uh, so it has to be a very good fit in the, the soft part in terms of honesty, and get along well. So finding the right partner and the right people. Uh, one is a co-founder on the co-founding level, but on the other one is finding the right people to, to complement the team. At the beginning, I'm talking about outsourcing, like an accountant, like a front-end developer, like a, a marketing person who might not be on a long-term basis, but it's hard to, to find the right mix of people. So anything, um, the, the, the best investment of my time has been to find uh, the skills and uh, combination of, uh, of characteristics that fit right for me in, in a company. Um, the most rewarding part of uh, being, uh, of starting this project, uh, I would say there are three points there, but I would, I would narrow it down to two dimensions. First is I come from a background in consulting where the client gets to say what it's meaningful what is the question to be answered? What do we need to learn? And that's fine. That's a very reward, rewarding career. It's a meaningful career. But I was ready to move into another phase of my life where I wanted to ask the right questions. I wanted to pursue the and learn for, for the benefit of my own company um, as opposed to learning for, for a client. So uh, first is to do things on my own terms. But also on the other dimension is I um, I'm uh, joining my spouse in a diplomatic uh, in her diplomatic career. So uh, this also means that it has to be able to uh, work for somebody who works long distance, uh, who w wants to who might be switching uh, time uh, uh, times uh, time zones uh, when, when you work. So this work also has to be. Uh, mobile and working in a, a, te a tech startup can be that that uh, final um, element where you can actually make uh, a meaningful work, but that follows you when you work uh, when you, when you change and you follow your your spouse. Um, now, useful resources uh, to to start um, or, or jumpstart a project. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk, uh, there are many uh, way, ways to, to, there are many things to say here, but um, 
anything that makes you learn uh, the skills you're going to need and anything that helps you find especially the demand of the product or service you are trying to uh, offer uh, it's going to be uh, essential so making tests on facebook and on, on the business uh, the business page of facebook um uh, doing tests tests on google about marketing uh, uh, has been uh, an amazing tool to, to, to find about the demand, but also um, places uh, where you can find and or, or finish up the, the things that you need to uh, you need to, to implement and execute your project, like uh, things learning how to do it on YouTube or going to meetups like a support group uh, or paying for a boot camp uh, it, it's a good investment of, of your time um one thing to suggest is fake it before you make it um uh, before starting investing uh, money or before launching something before building something it's always good to offer it advertise it uh, learn uh, learn about the demand and know who's willing to pay for what you're selling before hiring people investing money um, and or or uh, in general, the, devoting time to to finishing or uh, uh, to, to to really uh, have a prototype in in a perfect uh, uh, shape is better to fake it first, develop a most uh, a minimum valuable viable product MVP minimum viable minimum viable product sorry, and uh, so fake it before you make it. And I believe that's my my time, and I'm only and I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you for sharing, Raul. Um, we are the floor is open for questions, so please um, use the chat box, and um, if you have any questions, it will be we'll definitely get them directed toward Raul. Um, I do have one question for you, Raul. Um, how has uh, collaboration, um, I guess, changed or enhanced your, um, I guess, your concept? Um, like, how has how has going to some of the meetup groups or or joining the Facebook uh, just enhanced what you, uh, your what you've done, what where you are today? Um, what I, I um, it, it, well, in two in in two ways, um, I use. I have used um, uh, meetups uh, to, in this case, in this particular case, is to uh, strengthen the data science part of, part of my project. So I've joined data science groups and developers and fellow startup. I started the project in Latvia. So I joined um, uh, an incubator, an accelerator. So one is finding um tools to see join other people who are doing something similar and and um compare notes um complement your skills also find uh, people to build a team that's how i found my co-founder by getting out of the building going to to places to learn skills uh, i would count youtube as a place to to to, to learn about the things you need to you require to build up your product, and I was talking about Facebook as a and Google as a place to check for keyword search for learning how online marketing works, and that gives you the idea of the demand for your product or service or service. Okay, thank you. And we have time for one more question. So, and and I will go ahead and select. Um, what what is the best way um I, I guess in your opinion to find customers if you find out let me know but um the in my case facebook has been a great uh, tool um it lets you uh, tailor uh, or or it lets you uh, narrow down your 
uh, target your your marketing campaigns so you find people with the interests with uh, demographic characteristics uh, location so I would learn um, if, 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 if you if I would choose one thing one way of learn, finding my customers I would I would uh, go and find learn about uh, a business page in Facebook and start even tr tinkering with buying advertisement and designing a campaign see who clicks learn about the Facebook pixel and, and that's how you target your your and find uh, customers thank you Raul. thank you again Raul for all of your information uh, it sounds like you have a couple other questions which I think we'll be able to answer from the other panelists because I know that you're pressed on time and I would like to make sure that we have time for all the other panelists as well so thank you again and um, if we have any other follow-up questions we may email them to you at a later date please please do thank you please please do thank you thank you uh, our next panelist is Indira I don't know if you'll be able to join us via video but if not it, um, the stage is now yours and you can go ahead and control the slides Indira, one second before you get started. For the contractor who's doing the, the closed captioning, the connection has been lost and the closed captioning is not showing up. If you can please reestablish the connection. Thank you. Okay, Indira. You're Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope everyone hears me. I wanted to turn the camera on just for a couple of minutes uh, so we can put the face to name. Um, but uh, if the connection is, um, it, maybe I'll turn it off later. So thanks for having me. I am in Connecticut, US, uh, while my husband um, is in Afghanistan serving for a couple of years. Um, I lost my voice because I I was at three large festivals, wine festivals in in uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Philly, Harrisburg, and and Pittsburgh, presenting my wines and just um, talking for hours nonstop. Uh, apologize for that. I'm happy to be here. I just wanted to. Um, uh, start uh, the, the biggest obstacles. Yes, let's talk about this. I always, um, ever since I immigrated to the States in 96, I, I was mesmerized with, with small businesses um, and how so many people were making money in so many different ways. It's just unimaginable to somebody that, that moved from a socialist country where everything was state owned um, and there were not that many opportunities. So that was a dream um, to maybe one day have my own business, but I, I couldn't afford that and um, uh, had to work. First of all, had to start learning English because I could not speak English in 96 whatsoever. So I had to work during the day um, and go to school at night. Um, and um, so that that was that was the biggest obstacle at that time. So um, so so time was the the not just not enough uh, time and to start a business really um, you you do have to have some uh, some funds to start. I would say I'm not a big risk taker, so I I decided to start very small with with um, not a lot of uh, resources, but um, I understand um, if you have opportunity to have investor or somebody uh, to help you, that, that that's great as well. To me, um, the time when my husband joined the Foreign Service and we moved overseas uh, was after after 12 years, actually after tw 10 years overseas, I decided this is the time to to start because really the benefits that Foreign Service uh, gives us pretty much no no bills while we live overseas um, gave me opportunity to um, quit working at the embassy and and starting a small business. I have to thank um, I have to thank. Uh, uh,
Global Employment Advisor, Vicky Lenhart, for for helping me and pushing me a little bit to to realize my dream I had. Let me advance the slide to the next one. Uh, so what has been the biggest challenge to have, that you have faced since you have started? Wow, yes. Um, had no idea. So, so actually going back to uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina to serve at the American Embassy there, uh, which was home for me, um, I, I realized after leaving for um, Bosnia, I realized that I wanted to continue working and doing something for my country and I wanted to give back to my country. Um, there was 67% uh, youth unemployment in Bosnia, 43% uh, unemployment overall. Uh, all young educated people were leaving the country and never to return back to live there, um, just like I left and will probably never return uh, to live there. My, my kids don't even uh, speak Bosnian that well. Uh, so I decided I, I will uh, try to create jobs, um, small me, um, try to create some jobs for young people there um, by selling and opening the market, um, a huge market uh, for like US, for something that they have been producing in Bosnia and Herzegovina for thousands of years. And wine was the product that uh, they were ready and had laboratories um, uh, recognized by the rest of the world. So um, I looked into uh, starting to export wines. Hopefully, hopefully that will um, uh, create some opportunities for young people in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So that's how I I um, started. So three years ago, uh, we 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 left. Bosnia and were posted in um, Austria, in Vienna, and that's where I decided to use the three years in Austria to learn how to how to do this. I didn't know anything about the wine industry. I didn't know how. Didn't even know how much uh, wine fits on one pallet. And container was just something I, I had no clue. Uh, I didn't think that would ever happen. Um, just for for the information, I, I just imported the third container of wine to the U.S., which fits 17,000 bottles of wine. Um, so I'm going all over and selling that now. Uh, so using using our posting in Austria really was uh, was a good time. I had no bills. I started, um, you can learn anything you put your mind to. We all know that. So um, everything is really available on the internet. Um, another benefit that we have as spouses, no matter where we are, as diplomats, we do, we have right to have jobs in the local economy. And not only that, but we have right to open our own businesses. Wow. So in Austria, I was able to get a license to import wine and other products to Austria. And I was told that that is so hard to get for normal Austrian citizens. But uh, we do have some privileges. So I was able to get this, this license and started importing wine from Bosnia to Austria uh, without really knowing a word of German. But I knew that I'm going to target um, our own American community and international community, English-speaking community. Then I learned that there were 600,000 ex-Yugoslavians that lived in Austria. Uh, that's where uh, that's my uh, that speak my native language. So I thought, okay, this, I'm going to start small. I'm going to start um, selling to Americans at first wines that they've never tasted before, tried before, or have tried and fell in love with, and um, and to um, Yugoslavians that live there, um, and also Germans, Austrians that do speak English. So 
it was not really that a uh, great success, but I did run the, that business for a couple of years and in the same time started learning and applying for licenses to get these wines to the States. So uh, let me move um, move to the next slide to see what I wanted to tell you about that. What has been the most rewarding part of self-employment during your time abroad? Um, it's a lot of work. It, it, it's a lot of dedication, uh, but um, I'm not afraid of working, and um, it, it feels it feels good to make decision and um, do things, um, not have to wait months for the approval of uh, from somebody else or from Washington for for a small change. Um, so that that I I like that. Um, also, yes. Yeah, so, so you have all the time. You, you you need to manage your you manage your time the way you want, the way you need it. Uh, you have enough time to learn whatever project you need to tackle next. And I like being self-employed. I would recommend it to everybody. And as a matter of fact, I I am calling on all the spouses that are thinking about starting their own business to um, get in touch with me. Um, I am looking for, if you're posted in a winemaking country, I would like to hear from you. Let's start importing wines from those countries. Um, my, um, you can find me, uh, my, my cell phone, my email, probably here on webinar, it's gonna be posted. Um, but uh, Wines of Illyria, um, dot com is my website, and also I'm on Facebook as well. Wines of Illyria USA is my uh, Facebook. Uh, please, please get in touch with me. Or if you're in the U.S. and in you, you are, I'm looking for distributors for all states. So there are opportunities to work together. Please let me know if you are interested. What resources have you found most helpful in any area of your business, including finances, time management, marketing, and advertising, or mentorship? Well, my first uh, line was uh, work with your GEA at Post. Yes, please, please, if you have an idea and you want to um, just go for it, talk to your GEA. It's amazing. They are true experts and they really can help. Um, so um, everything is a challenge when you're new. Oh, yes, absolutely. The time management, when you when you own your own business and you're starting and you need to learn and you need to find customers and you need to sell, you need to close the deal. Time management is essential. Yeah, I need to, I, I'm constantly struggling with that and need to uh, get better and better and uh, learning sometimes to say no um, to sm smaller things, things that would take too much of your time. Um, I'm, I'm starting to learn that I have to say, that I have to say no to some things. I can't do everything. Um, financing the venture could be a challenge um, depending on what you do, yes. Um, Sure, I like I said at the beginning, I really am not into taking huge risks. So I started very, very small with importing one pallet of wine, which was 600 bottles, and it took me six months to sell it. Um, but um, yeah, so starting small and growing, um, making money first before you expand is the way I am more comfortable uh, on doing rather than uh, borrowing the money. To start something that you might it might not it might not work because you never know, but be positive, stay positive, and believe in yourself. Uh, oh, marketing, yes, marketing dollars. I mean, it is so so expensive to pay somebody to do marketing for you. So, I would say that's a skill that you need you need to learn um, a little bit of it from the beginning at the beginning to be able to to be able to create the simple things really create your own website um, create your own um, um, Facebook page for your business 
uh, tweeted. Um, so you using technology absolutely uh, to do some um, uh, small marketing campaigns and reach people is a must. You need to be able to create and manipulate. Um, my time coming up. Somebody's telling me I'm talking, uh, uh, taking too long. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, what would you suggest to other EFMs as they start their own business? Yes, do not be afraid of it. Just, just go for it. Um, you have to have moral support. Um, from, your, from your family. Um, I had to quit, quit my job, quit working at the embassy and, and having income. So it was, um, my husband said, Yes, go ahead. It's time for you to do it, and he will. That's what's happening. Um, please never forget your fellow EFMs. We should be helping each other. This is a big network where we can really empower each other, help each other. So my first, my first uh, money that I spent for my my business was creating business cards. Well, I used um, um, family member. Um, a young man in Vienna that was studying, uh, getting ready to start studying marketing, actually. So he was finishing high school and going to study marketing. And I paid him to create my, my first business card. So um, also first photos, professional photos for my bottles of my wine. EFM did that. Right now, I use EFM for as my CPA. So this is the first group that I go to um, when I am looking to for, looking for skills. So write me if you have if you think you can help me with that with something. I I need people that can write. Um, so contact me, please. Um, yes, networking, following up. Yes. Build constant pipeline of things um, of things you've done and things you need to do, and uh, be consistent in following up um, to keep those relationships. Let's talk. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you very much for listening. If anybody has any questions, then I will I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Adira. Um, yeah, uh, sorry for that. Um, 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 floor is open for questions. I uh, looks like one is coming in, and the question is, how do you compete in the U.S.? What's um, in the U.S.? Uh, what's your what's your niche? <laughs> So great question. So I decided there's so much wine on the market. It's unbelievable. But I decided not to be afraid of it uh, and just uh, go for it. I imported wines, only native varieties uh, from Southeast Europe. So right now from Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia to import and uh, pretty much I'm the first person that started doing that. So when I go in, it, it's very difficult uh, because big importers, huge importers and distributors, they like to import themselves everything um, and, and distribute in the States. So it's hard to compete against them. Uh, customers, so retail store, liquor stores and restaurants, they like to buy uh, multiple products from one one distributor. So that's another challenge I'm having. But so far I have uh, I have become a vendor for Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board, which is the state owned run um, enterprise of, of buying um, buying all alcoholic be beverages. They own 670 stores. I was told not to waste my time trying to get into Pennsylvania because it's impossible to become their vendor. Well, I 
wrote them email and told them who I am and what I am importing and guess what? Within a month, I had a meeting to, well, for them to taste my wine. I am a vendor 27719. And uh, my wines are right now in 38 stores through Pennsylvania, hoping to one day have them in all 670 stores. Uh, but it will take a lot of work. Then I have a wholesale license to distribute in New Jersey. I just found distributor for New York a month ago. Uh, for New Hampshire, for Vermont, Missouri, and Kentucky. So looking for distributor in DC, in Virginia, and Maryland, like immediately. Um, yeah, I hope that answered the question. Um, let's see. How do you compete in the U.S. market? Okay, I already answered that. Can you take your business with you anywhere you go? And if so, how do you handle your workforce? Well, I, I don't have any employees yet. I am ready to start uh, uh, employing salespeople. This business, I, I think when Jim is done with Afghanistan in two years, he's thinking, uh, there are some interesting posts available for him. So I, uh, if I can move uh, to just importing and, and selling it to big distributors, I can do it from anywhere in the world. Um, being ambassador of my brand because I created my, my own brand of wines, Wines of Illyria, to tell the uh, story of a uh, Illyrian ship and what has found um, 10 years ago that were 2,100 years old um, in southern Bosnia and Herzegovina. It was a, a, a proof of winemaking history that goes back to ancient times. Um, so so I, the, the brand Wines of Illyria is my own, own brand um, telling about this ship and, and history. Well, that, that's, um, I, I constantly need to work on that and tell customers about it. So uh, wine and story um, they just go together. So that would be a little more challenging because face-to-face uh, -face, um, sometimes is, is the best. But definitely I can work part-time from anywhere and be part-time in the U.S. Yeah. Well, thank you for your thank questions you. and have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Um, before we ra move on to Jack's presentation, um, I just wanted to see, Jeremy wanted to mention something, and I don't know if his microphone is working or if it's still off. Jeremy, if you want to see, is that working now? <laughs> Perfect. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just on behalf of the Family Liaison Office, uh, Indira, you were very lucky. Um, you were in a country where we do have a bilateral work agreement. If you are another EFM who is considering doing a business on the local economy, please make sure you check with your GEA to make sure, and to, with our website, that we have a bilateral work agreement in place that allows you as a diplomatic spouse to be able to work on the local economy. That is really important um, to make sure that we're abiding by all of the US and host country laws. So we always need to make sure that we have a, if there's a bilat in place before we're doing things on the local economy. If you have any questions, contact your GEA. Um, I also really liked Indira's um, statement to work with other EFMs. If you need help finding someone to provide guidance in a particular area or to help you out or to serve as a mentor, please work through your GEA. And we have our network of GEAs that we can find an EFM who can help you out. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I do want to thank every thank you, Indira, again very much for your information um, and your presentation. I do want to thank everybody for participating. As you can see, we still have two more panelists. We do have the room um, for about another 40 minutes. So if you are able to stay on for a little bit longer, I don't think we'll go the full 40 minutes, but a little bit longer, we would like to hear the stories of Jack and Natalia, who have wonderful stories about their experience starting a business as well. Jack, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. So go ahead and take the stage, Jack. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Can you yes, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. I, I first want to start off by thanking um, Anna, Kim, and Fred, and the rest of the Flow team for the opportunity to 
present today. I want to start off um, and share with you a brief history of how Ugly Bags came about. Uh, my family and I were a family of seven, three kids with my in-laws, so there's seven of us and we love to travel. My wife and I have been to over 90 different countries. Our kids, who are 13 and 6, have been to over 40 different countries. And one of the most frustrating part about traveling is um, the baggage claim experience. Uh, after long hours on the plane and you're standing there at the baggage claim with over a few hundred other people that, that are on the same plane, and you're trying to identify your bags. And uh, there's 14 bags that we have to identify, and most of the bags all look the same. Well, three years ago, uh, my daughter, one of my daughter's bags were taken by accident, and it took us five days to locate the bags, and we were on a seven-day vacation. So that pretty much ruined her vacation experience. So I wanted to go out there and uh, look for a company that provide customized bag or find a bag out on the market that was the ugliest bag out there that no one else would have and would be easy for us to identify after a long plane ride. But uh, three years ago, there was no company out there, so we, I decided to start my own company. So starting my own company, there's, you know, what was the biggest hesitation is the fear of the unknown. How do I get started? How do I finance it? How do I market it? How do I sell it? All the answers to these questions were unknown. But you have to do what you dream of doing, and even while you're afraid, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Yes, it will be fear. Yes, there will be unknown. But you just have to start and hope for the best. What has been the biggest challenge that you faced since you started? Communication. You have to communicate. Communication is very important in any relationship. Communication between yourself on goals and expectations for your business. Communication between your business partners on roles and responsibility. Communication between you and your clients. When at all possible, talk in person or over the phone, because words over emails can be misinterpreted. Uh, clear and concise and regular communication is essential to a successful business. My partner and I, we talk on a weekly basis, and we make sure that um, all our goals are aligned with each other on a weekly basis, and uh, nothing falls through the crack. What has been the most rewarding part of self-employment during your time abroad? I have to say family time. Um, prior to moving overseas, as a diplomat, I was working in sales and marketing where I was required to travel six months out of the year, one week at home, one week on the road. So I missed the first four years of my twin daughter's lives. Having my own online business allows me to work from home and to be involved with the kids' schools and activities. I was able to be there for them and watch them grow. All three of my kids are now involved with the company and helping with design ideas for ugly bags. Family time has been the biggest reward. As you see in the slides, those are my three kids, and those are the bags that they help design. And on the right uh, picture is uh, my wife's set. She, um, she took pictures from our fa her favorite vacation of the kids and put it on her bags. No one else, as you can see, as now that we travel around the world, no one else will have the same bag as us. It's just unique to the individual. What resources have you found most helpful? Um, I learned early, early on in my career that networking was key to success. Uh, one of the best advice I've ever gotten is not how much you know, but who you know. Uh, yes, strive to be the best in your field, be the expert get a master or a doctorate degree in your field, but at the end of the day, you are just one person. You cannot run a successful business by yourself. Use your network as resources, bypass long hours of research and leverage. Uh, leverage your, uh, your network. Um, perfect example, we, uh, prior to launching our company, we spent most of our investment on product development and staff. And we did not have enough money when we launched the company to do any marketing or sales promotion. So what we did is we reached out to our network of warm leads, friends and families, 
We enlisted their help on spreading the words and sharing our websites across social media. Just from our network alone, we exceed our sales goals for 2017. Also, through our networks and contacts, we were um, able to sponsor a lot of charities and events around the world, including uh, Miss Universe Barbados, as you see in the slide there, that's Miss Universe Barbados. Uh, we also sponsor Miss Universe Guam. We also sponsor the Barbados Independent Film Festival. So my advice here is to um, leverage your contacts and network, network, and network. What is one thing you would suggest for EFM as they start their business? Uh, find a solution to a problem. Uh, that's what I did with Ugly Bags. We uh, we had an issue, uh, a problem of our, our daughter's bag being taken, and we wanted to um, find a solution for it. Uh, find something that you're passionate about and love to do. Uh, I get up every morning excited to see my customer, what my customer have created and designed for their bags. Each bag is unique and has a personal story behind the design. Uh, you have to find something that you enjoy and love doing. Uh, closing remark, um, having my own online business allows me the freedom, flexibility, and time. Freedom to make decisions without several layers of approval process. Flexibility to work from anywhere in the world. And time to travel and spend with my family and loved ones. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you, everyone. And I'll welcome any questions. Thank you, Jack. And actually, a question just came in. Do you make customized luggage? <laughs> that's that's our whole um, uh, our whole idea and our whole company. We do customize luggage. So you can uh, design your own um, prints, or you can send in your favorite pictures. Uh, of your vacation, your family, you can put numbers, letters, whatever you want on the bags, unless it, the only thing we don't do is print anything that's copyrighted on the, to the bags. Okay. And I will ask uh, this one more question here. How do you choose, um, how do you choose your partner? How do you choose the network uh, that you're building? Well, the, I was lucky enough to find a partner who was already in the bag business. Uh, he was, uh, my partner has factories that does um, process Louis Vuitton, Gucci bags, uh, using leather. And uh, I've approached and pitched the idea of ugly bags to him. Uh, I asked if he can take the same process and uh, print on larger uh, leather that can wrap around uh, luggage size, and uh, he was able. He told me he was able to do it, and he has the facilities, the know-how, the finances to do already. So uh, he was the perfect partner for me at the perfect time. Wonderful, thank you, Jack. It sounds like you have a lot of interest, as you can probably see. Um, but yes, the concept is wonderful, and just the fact that you're able to do it from different parts of the world is what we're really wanting to focus on, the variety of different companies that you can start. Um, for anybody who has any additional questions for Jack, we will send out some contact information with the recording of the webinar for all of the panelists. So we are going to take this time to now move on to our final panelist, Natalia. Thank you again, Jack. Um, Natalia, if you are on, I will now hand it over to you. Yes, I'm here. How are you? Great, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. So my name is uh, Natalia Rankin Galloway. I'm very um, honored to to be on this panel um, with all of these other uh, illustrious individuals. Um, I think that uh, what I'm going to try and do now is be very minimal on the story of uh, culturebaby.com, uh, mostly because uh, you can't go there anymore. Uh, we have closed the business. So I think that much of what I'm going to talk to you about today is how I came to that decision. Um, I think it's, it's wonderful that you're hearing from these you know, current entrepreneurs who are, are doing amazing things. Um, and hopefully uh, my story will also give you a sense of um, 
um, mistakes made, but also uh, things that I don't regret at all uh, in, in terms of having started the business, uh, run it for about uh, five years, and then ultimately closed it. Um, so just uh, to, to jump off a little bit from this slide, um, I didn't really have an early interest in entrepreneurship. The thing that drove me to do it uh, was a sense of frustration that I'm confident a lot of you have felt. Uh, we moved back from Japan to New York at the height of the recession, and I was not able to find a position um, in my chosen field. And I ended up working in, in a field that was slightly outside of my own which was a bad cultural fit and um, ultimately ended up being uh, fired at eight months pregnant. So um, for me, it was a feeling of I'm never going to get I'm never going to get inroads into uh, the area I want to be in. I'm never going to establish myself when we keep moving every two to three years. And so for me, um, the idea wasn't so much uh, about just being an entrepreneur. Uh, I got the idea for Culture Baby, which was a mission-driven uh, e-commerce business focused on baby and kids products that were culturally relevant. So uh, espadrilles from Spain, uh, woolens from Chile, uh, that kind of thing. And the idea uh, for that came, and it just wouldn't leave me, and it was in my you know, niggling me in my stomach and kind of the logo popped into my head and it was just all there. And then kind of following from that was, and wouldn't this be amazing to do something that I could take with me and be master of my own destiny uh, when we move again? So um, I was very worried about my lack of experience or knowledge. I had never been in the retail sector. Um, I kind of, uh, through the severance package I got from, from being dismissed, decided that I would use those funds and just said, okay, well, I have no idea where I'm going to allocate these funds or what's the best thing to do, but I kind of decided that part of the genius of it was just in doing it. Um, the kind of hindsight insight into that would be that I think because I felt that the genius was in doing it, that I needed to, A, kind of jump in, you know, cannonball style, uh, instead of dipping my toe in the water, um, I would very much back up Raul on his insights in the uh, minimum viable product route. Um, if you haven't read The Lean Startup, I would highly recommend it. Um, and this kind of fake it till you make it. One of the other panelists had a question about, you know, what does that mean in an e-commerce universe? I think that very often what you can do is you can build an e-commerce platform using something like a Shopify or a Wix with kind of very minimal input, but you can make it look amazing and, and kind of punch above your weight with very little investment. Um, and what, that's what we did. And we, we um, ultimately, in order to move the e-commerce platform with us, we wanted to move, work on a dropship basis. So not actually stocking product, but um, being able to work with different people who are making product to say, hey, we're going to take these orders for you and then we are going to ship them um, on your behalf. So we're almost like we're a platform for you. Um, I did invest in some product to have while I was in New York so that, you know, it looked like I had product behind the site before I started making those connections. Um, so that's how we implemented kind of Lean Startup. But I would say it would have been wiser on my behalf because I was kind of selling an idea of culturally relevant baby products, and I didn't really know the market. Uh, if hindsight, uh, if I had the benefit of hindsight, I would have said I would have maybe started a blog first with sort of on the side retail so that I could start to understand my customer. What do they want? What don't they want? What appeals? What price points work? What price points don't work? And you could start to understand that as a, as a blogger. A perfect example would be uh, we invested in quite a few uh, Chilean woolen um, hats and mittens um, as a product, and the feedback from the customers were they're, they're scratchy. Um, and if any of you are parents, you know you know your kids are not going to wear them, however cute or culturally relevant they are, if they're scratchy. And if we had had that as a blog or a giveaway, we would have been able to get that feedback before investing quite a bit in the purchase of that product uh, for retail. Um, so what I'll move ahead in my slide here. I think I can do it. There we go. Um, you have all asked a lot of questions about marketing and advertising, and you're absolutely right to be asking those questions. And I think all of the panelists today would say, it's the hardest thing. How do I get eyeballs on my website? How do I get people to pay attention? Um, it's a huge challenge. I, I think that to hear uh, Jack talk, I think he, he did it in an amazing way. You know, warm leads, absolutely. You know, cold calling is really hard. Uh, and we had some, you know, really near misses. We had some some PR you know, really coups, we, we got our product on The View, 
um, the, the bummer there was we kind of did it ourselves, didn't use professional PR, and the individual who shared our product on The View never shared the website. Um, we also had a call from the Today Show, which ultimately got canceled. So you can have a lot of, you know, near misses, and I would say that wherever you can, you know, use the warm leads, use the contact, use the network, use guerrilla marketing, uh, definitely do it. And um, don't try to necessarily compete with the big guys. You know, we're not Amazon and we can't ship for free. Um, and, and you have to understand that your, your customers will ultimately understand that. There definitely seems to be an appeal these days among customers for authentic, small-scale entrepreneurs. Um, so they don't necessarily expect you to ship and do free returns and things like that. Um, I also wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what was rewarding uh, for me. As I said, the reason I joined was this feeling that I wanted to be master of my own destiny and wanted to have freedom and independence to travel at, when I could. Um, and when I was in Morocco, I was able to do a lot of sourcing. We ended up, um, go, I went to Tangiers and found um, poofs that were made in, um, you know, children's patterns. And so they were culturally relevant and beautiful. I got to blog about it. Uh, and all of that was was wonderful and great and fulfilling. Um, the thing that I did not care for about entrepreneurship, and I'm sure that um, the other panelists contested this, it is a 24-7 proposition. Um, you're, you have to be in it. You have to be have fire in your belly for it, um, which it certainly seems like, like Jack and Indira and, and Raul have. Um, and I did too. Uh, ultimately, what I ended have more, had ended up having more of a fire in my belly for was the idea of conscious commerce, of social enterprise, of business being a force for good um, than I had for my product line, which is uh, ultimately what brought me um, to Georgetown and the social enterprise initiative after I closed the business. Um, the other thing that for me was really challenging about the 24-7 proposition of entrepreneurship is um, I, I like to have a divide between the end of my work day and the beginning of my family day. Um, and I was really struggling to get that with entrepreneurship. It was, you know, back online right after work. And especially when you aren't getting paid, that's, um, that's hard to handle. And so for me, I, I would caution you that um, entrepreneurship can be very all-encompassing. Um, what did I want to say on the next slide? Uh, the resources I use, other entrepreneurs for sure. Um, wherever you are, uh, you go to Startup Week or um, Startup um, um, is an international uh, organization, people who are lean startup practicants all around the world, uh, female entrepreneurship groups if you're a woman, um, you know, entrepreneurs for, you know, minorities, entrepreneurs for you know, any, any sort of group that you can join and kind of just get, you know, learn from other people's mistakes, learn from other people's um, successes. Uh, co-work spaces. Um, it can be very isolating to work from home sometimes, and if you're used to, you know, the water cooler, a co-work space can be a great, you know, pretty small investment. And also angel investors. Um, I ended up uh, getting going when I came back to D.C. through several um, investment rounds and, um, you know, applications for funding, uh, one with a group called Conscious Capitalism out of uh, Rockville, Maryland, and another one with um, Pipeline uh, Investors, which is a, fema a group that trains investors, women investors, to invest in women-owned businesses. And um, those investors can really, sometimes it's hard to hear because they will tell you exactly what is wrong uh, with your business model um, and how you can fix it. Uh, ultimately, for me, the investor that kind of opened my eyes to where my interest was moving, you know, kind of away from my product line and toward social entrepreneurship concepts, um, you know, it was in a conversation where she was telling me she wasn't going to invest. Uh, she liked the idea but ultimately told me it would probably take another two to three years of revising the business model and two to three years with no income, which many of you may know in Washington, D.C., on one income is not easy. Um, so that was a great conversation for me ultimately. And while I don't still have the business and won't be taking it with us on our next move to Germany, it has been instrumental in helping me shape my own destiny. It's gotten me into the world that I swim in now, which is, you know, business as a force for good and corporate social responsibility that I've been working with um, the team here at Georgetown on for the past three and a half years. I never would have been where I am now as the associate director of the initiative if it wasn't for Culture Baby. So I would also encourage you all that, you know, as Raul said at the beginning, don't be afraid of failure because um, you could say you could say that Culture Baby failed because it closed, but I do not look at it 
as that at all. I look at it as a, a, a meaningful, uh, enjoyable part of my life um, that I'm really grateful for. Um, I would just close with um, another suggestion. If you are looking for a partner, I think a, a number of the panelists spoke to this. Um, be honest with yourself about what you don't know um, and go and find a partner. I think it, it sounds like Jack spoke to this precisely, um, somebody who was in the bag industry. Um, I ended up picking a partner who was very similar to me, so we got along like a house on fire, but that wasn't necessarily the best for the business. Uh, the best for the business would have been me, for me to fill the gaps in my experience um, and to find somebody perhaps with a more finance or accounting background because that was hard. Um, the other thing was very often you have to value your time as well. Um, for example, you know, it may be cheaper for you to spend the entire day figuring out how to illustrate an image or, or edit a, an image if you're not familiar with Adobe Illustrator. Or you could go on something like a TaskRabbit or an Odesk and pay somebody $10 who has the experience to do it in 10 minutes. Um, so I would encourage you to be very honest with what you can do and to value your time, uh, especially as an entrepreneur. There is nothing more valuable. Um, so make sure that you can take advantage of, of the gig economy in that way. Um, all right, I think I am going to leave it there and open up for questions. I hope that was useful, and I'm absolutely at anybody's disposal to answer questions uh, after this as well. Thank you, Natalia. That was that was great. Um, looks like a question is coming in, so I'll give it a quick second. Actually, let's go. Let's use that one that came from Anne in El Salvador. What thing or moment? help you to reach the decision to finally close? Um, so I kept it open for a few, it's a very good question. When I, I kept it open for about a year and a half uh, after I started back working full time. So just trying to do some sort of marketing on the side. And we were still making the occasional sale. Uh, for us, it was just, we, we realized that when we did do marketing campaigns that we had some success. We would drive traffic, we would make sales. Uh, but ultimately we realized that it was just, you know, directly proportional. The effort we put in uh, was directly proportional to the sales we would make. And we were both, again, working full time. Um, so uh, we made the decision that, you know what, unless we are going to dedicate ourselves to this, it is not going to be worthwhile. Uh, even the costs of keeping the website up are not going to support uh, the sales. So, you know, we even, we even kept it up for a while just because we loved still talking about it to people and showing them the website. We were tremendously proud of it. But but ultimately, you know, there's there's a cost even in maintaining a website. We used Shopify, the platform. Um, and uh, it, it was, I think, a $70 expense a month. And, and once, you know, we weren't dedicating the time to the marketing sales, that was an expense we weren't making back. Um, so that's that, that was the moment, I think, when we started to realize outlay was going to be greater than input. Uh, if we didn't um, dedicate ourselves to it, that was it. And uh, Indira was asking me about the website. We, we used uh, Odesk and TaskRabbit. Um, those are uh, individuals, just little gig economy people. You can put a call out there, say, I need an image edited. I think I found somebody did it for eight, $8. Excellent. If there are any other questions um, for, for anyone who's still here, please go ahead and, and let us know. And we will see if we can get those questions answered in this time. And, oh, yeah, looks like there are some questions coming. I, I will ask a question while we're waiting uh, for questions here. Um, was there any, I guess, were you ever able, when you were working uh, Culture Baby, were you ever able to find that work-life balance that you were, yeah, that you were craving or that you were hoping to get um, while the business was in full swing? Um, yes, uh, in, in so far as feeling that I had a fulfilling uh, career at the same time as I was abroad with my husband. Um, it gave me the sense of um, that sense of empowerment. So I think that was a, an element of balance. I think there's lots of different ways to describe balance. Um, but it was always, I was never offline to it. 
Um, I was never completely out of it. And that's, you know, when I go on holiday now, I like to be fully offline. <laughs> um, and, and you can't, I couldn't do that. Um, so that, that was, I, in that way, I didn't find the balance. Um, would I, would I do it again? Um, I don't know that I would, because again, uh, if I got something that this, I couldn't go to sleep, I couldn't put my head down on the pillow without thinking about it, I would consider it. But I would consider it knowing what I know now, which is this will be all encompassing. Um, maybe I'll do it when I'm an empty nester. Um, <laughs> Or, or something like that, but I, I don't know that um, it'll be for me. I would consider, you know, doing joining the gig economy myself, being a, a short-term consultant or something like that, project-based. But I don't know that I'd start my own business again, not at this stage. Okay. Would you like me to answer this other question that's come in? Sure, go for it. Um, would I choose a different pro well I had lots and lots of different products um, we had a selection from all over the world uh, yeah there's a number of them I, I would not have invested in um, again I think I put too much in um, focus on the message of my website which was sustainable culturally relevant the idea was that you know when when somebody has a baby you want to get them a gift that's relevant to them so you know you're in El Salvador for example I would maybe if you were expecting want to get you a gift that had Salvadorian relevance um, and I put too much emphasis on that and sort of the, the marketing of it than on the product quality itself. And that's hard. You're talking to people on sort of two different bandwidths. And especially with baby products, people are very um, interested in what they call the hand feel. Does it feel soft? Uh, is it something you're going to like for the baby? Is it cute? And ultimately, those were the selling factors that matter to our customers more than it's Salvadorian, it's Chilean, it's authentic, it's all of this. Um, so it was, I think that was for us, we were also sort of diverging the customer's attention um, to, in too many different directions. So yeah, we would have chosen a number of different products. Uh, and I but I think that you find a lot of um, uh, companies would maybe report the same. There's some products that work, some don't. Okay. Um, there are still questions rolling in. Um, in light of time, I think we, well, hold on. So Sophie's question um, regarding what strategies do you use to sell your products? Um, do you have time to answer that one really quickly? Yeah, well, the, I would say the products weren't customized, but they were small scale. So we would be buying, you know, maybe from a small scale producer who was only making, you know, 10 chuyos or 10 booties or something like that. So they were small scale. Um, they were often hard to find anywhere else, which we thought was a, was a great selling proposition. But again, um, we focused too much on things like, you know, cultural relevance and, and less on the feeling. Um, in terms of the strategies we used to sell it, again, I think, I think our strategies were occasionally the wrong ones. Um, and on, on baby products, at least, we should have focused much more on just marketing the cuteness and marketing the softness. Uh, than on the cultural factor. Um, with regard to writing, finding a blog, um, you you have a lot of people who are uh, freelance writers. Um, uh, if you do a, just a, a Google search freelance writers, but people at TaskRabbit and Odesk and any number of, of gig economy websites like that, like Upwork, I think somebody shared, uh, will happily take on, um, you know, paid, you will have to pay them um, to, to blog uh, for your product. Wonderful. Thank you, Natalia, and thank you to all of the panelists and to the participants for staying on for an extended period of time. Um, at this point, we're going to just wrap it up quite quickly. And many of you already know about the Global Employment Initiative Program, many of the GEAs that have put together and participated in this webinar and who speak to all of the CLOs and participants daily or weekly. Just a quick list of the services that we do provide for our clients around the world. And the final, give me a second as I transition to the final panel. Um, there are a couple of files that you can download that have a little bit of information on the FAM regulations and what to know if you are going to go into business for yourself and resources for working virtually. One thing that did not get asked but does sometimes get addressed when many of us give these presentations about sales and retail is the use of the DPO. So all of that is in the FAM regulations information that you can go ahead and download and use for yourself. 
Just a final slide, we have one final presentation as part of this four-part series, and it will be on June 5th, and it's on photography and design. So we will be able to hear from several photographers and graphic design artists who have been able to start their own business and take it with them to several different posts. Thank you again for participating. Once the meeting closes, there will be an opportunity to participate in a short survey so that we can make these webinars better for all of you in the future. Thank you.